Okay. Great. Um, all right. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi. Thanks for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, as, as, as the introduction suggested, I'm Connor Karczewski. Um, I'm the lead author on the Nomad, uh, the recent Nomad preprint um, that, uh, that we, we put together uh, in the MacArthur Lab. Um, and today I'm just going to give a brief overview of the Nomad Consortium, uh, you know, what, how it, like, what the data set is, looks like, uh, the, um, and, and some things we can learn about loss of function variation from, uh, from, from the data set. Um, later, Ryan will talk about the structural variants, but I'll be focusing on the single nucleotide variants and short insertions and deletions in indels. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's, I'm, I'm sure this group is fairly familiar with this kind of thing, but um, there's a range of, uh, of impacts that a loss of function variant might have on a gene. So, um, uh, here I'm showing just this, uh, this cartoon that I like to refer to. Um, and so, imagine if we could put each of the 20,000 genes in the human genome along a spe spectrum of sensitivity to functional disruption. That is like the clinical or phenotypic impact that a loss of function variant might have in a gene. For instance, here on the left are genes where we'll never see loss of function variants in living humans, as these would be incompatible with human life. In the middle are variants in genes that we typically study in, um, in the clinical genetic space, so including causal factor variants for dominant or recessive diseases um, to risk factors for complex diseases. And then over here on the right, we have the genes that are relatively tolerant of loss of function variation, potentially even homozygous inactivation. Um, and in some rare cases, we have you know, variants like uh, loss of function variants of PTSK9, where there's actually some beneficial uh, or potential beneficial um, uh, effects of that variant, um, although those are exceedingly rare and very hard to find, at least with uh, data like this. Um, but in any case, uh, unlike model organisms where we can effectively engineer such mutations, um, there are obvious technical and ethical barriers to doing so in humans. Uh, but when we sequence healthy individuals or individuals with common diseases, we find plenty of genes inactivated in the forms of naturally occurring predicted loss of function variants of PLOS. Um, however, a few things kind of conspire to make this difficult. Um, in particular, identifying these loss of function variants is quite challenging for two reasons. One, that they're rare and that they're enriched for artifacts. Um, and I'll go through each of these and uh, kind of how we deal with that. So the fact that they're rare, one easy solution to this is to sneak with more and more individuals. So that's what we've been doing over the years. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the, you know, kind of the graph and what we've, uh, you know, what we've kind of amassed over the over the last decade or so. Um, but basically, uh, you know, the we started by uh, putting together as many exomes as we could, um, in the, and we released this into the form of 60,000 exomes a few years ago um, in the, uh, the exec, the exec consortium, the exome aggregation consortium. Um, but then more recently, sometime a couple years ago, uh, we put together what we call the, what we kind of call the super set of that, which is the genome aggregation database. Um, this comprises about 12, 125,000 exomes and 15,000 genomes. Um, this data set is a is more or less a superset of exec. Exactly, um, we lost some samples for various reasons, including QC. Um, we were a little bit more stringent on the QC this time around, um, so there's there's definitely reasons why there may, there may not maybe variants in exact that are not nomad. Um, but for the most part, it certainly is a uh, it, it is a it is general superset of exact. Um, we've kind of been increasing in diversity a little bit. We've uh, added some new populations, um, although we're still about 55 or 60 percent or so European. Um, uh, in, in coming iterations of NOMAD, there's going to be a lot more diversity, so um, we're hoping that at the end of this year we'll be uh, um, putting forth one more release of NOMAD, the NOMAD V3, um, which will have the same number. Or it will not be an update on the exomes, but an update on the genome, um, and that will hopefully have a lot more genetic, or, uh, ancestral diversity across the, uh, across the world. Um, so we've released uh, a few months ago or so, I guess almost a year ago now, we've released a, a newer version of Nomad called 2.1.1, um, which if you've been using Nomad uh, for your analyses or for any, any filtering, um, I highly recommend switching to this version if you're using the data set. If you're using the browser, you're already uh, looking at this version, so um, you don't need to actually um, change anything there. Um, the data were provided by uh, over 100 principal investigators, um, and thanks to the tireless efforts of the Pro Genomics and Data Science platforms, um, these have been run through a uniform pipeline and joint policy tool from about you know, three petabytes or so of BAM files um, into about 36 terabytes of ETF files. So, you know, quite a bit more manageable 
um, obviously still a lot of data. Um, but yeah, the uh, we've developed this novel QC pipeline for this iteration, um, which uh, has I, I think substantially improved a lot of the quality, uh, a lot of the quality of this data set. Um, this pipeline is publicly available at broadio um, I've shared these slides, and hopefully these will get sent around. Uh, afterwards, or if they haven't already, um, so that you, if you miss any links, to, um, if this is more, you're more than welcome to have these. Um, the, the, um, this QC pipeline included uh, a very extensive sample QC um, that uh, you know, we kind of are very stringent to figure out exactly what and which samples we should include, um, and then also a, a, a new variant QC pipeline, uh, which, which is a Improve, we believe an improvement all over VQSR, the current gold standard is sealed. Um, we use this uh, random forest that basically takes a lot of um, quality metrics and uh, creates kind of a score for uh, a quality score for each variant. Um, all this QC and analysis was performed using Kale. So uh, for those who are more computationally minded in the crowd, I um, highly recommend using um, um, this to both analyze or, uh, or or even just kind of explore the data set. Uh, because it uh, it really does enable very fast scalable uh, computation on this data set. Um, you can scale it on the cloud to thousands of CPUs kind of relatively effortlessly, um, which for us actually uh, was was crucial because it enabled this kind of rapid iteration. So each component, like doing computing frequencies for every variant or um, or doing some of the QC steps, really got it down from weeks to hours. Um, obviously, there's a you know, computational cost that we pay for it. We're, we're, uh, we're paying uh, Google Cloud for uh, all the compute, um, but it really did enable kind of this uh, this science, which was which was uh, excellent. Um, so this data set, as I mentioned, has uh, quite a bit of uh, ancestral diversity. Um, here you can see on the right a plot of the uh, it's just called a UMAP plot, which is basically just taking the principal components um, and trying to put them on one 2D surface um, and and kind of keep Local distances uh, similar to each other, so um, each each pair of points is uh, probably the you know most closely related uh, pair of individuals. Although that does not then extend across the whole uh, the whole the whole data set, um, so you get some kind of funky shapes looking here. Um, but basically, in this data set, what we've then uh, uh, in it been a enabled to do is look at not just ancestral diversity at, at a continental level, but also at a subcontinental level. Um, so within Europeans, we were able to distinguish uh, Northwest Europeans from Southern Europeans, from Swedes, from Finns, from Estonians, um, and then within East Asians, we've um, uh, we've actually distinguished some Japanese individuals from Koreans, um, as well as uh, the other East Asian um, uh, uh, cluster. We've also released subsets of this data set. So in particular, we have uh, a subset of the data where the uh, the samples were marked as controls for a case control study. Um, this is obviously much fewer. Uh, 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 samples because less than half uh, the samples are, are like this, um, and then on top of that, we just don't have some information for that for so some of the cohorts they were not included. Um, we have co uh, subsets that include that <laughs> that included. Sorry. Oh. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Can I ask a question? Yep. Yeah. When you say controls only, uh, what what diseases have been watched? Um, so have this been, is. Uh, uh, so yeah, I should mention that Nomad is not necessarily a one disease, like it's not a disease cohort, it's actually a collection of different uh, cohorts from kind of the broad and broader community. Um, it includes... Uh, so when it said controls only, then it's control regarding what? A regarding that particular uh, data set. So we actually have, we, we don't have very much information about it. Basically, so um, the... Um, the fact that Nomad is comprised of all these different data sets that are um, of common disease, for instance, we might have a uh, data set from a diabetes case control um, uh, consortium and a heart disease case control consortium. And if someone was marked as a control within that data set... Actually, the point, I work on, on diabetes, and my point is if I look at um, a population on uh, Nomad, will I be sure that the patient doesn't have any diabetes? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, diabetes is actually one of our bigger, uh, our, one of our bigger contributors. So there's certainly a lot of data, okay. uh, data in there from from diabetes cohorts. Now the one, the controls only thing. The nice thing is that it was marked as a control for that particular um, disease. But um, just to be clear about that, that doesn't that means that if someone was marked as a control for a heart disease study, 
you know, most likely they don't have any other diseases, but it, that's not necessarily um, uh, guaranteed. So someone for, as a control for a heart disease study might actually have diabetes, and we have no way of knowing mm. that or figuring that out. So it's the best we can do. It's, it's a broad kind of overview of, uh, of variation for from relatively healthy individuals, you know, but obviously everyone, you know, at some point everyone is going to get some disease. So, so it, you know, the, the, the kind of perfect sure. healthy, you know, healthy control study is very good. Sure. I had another question about the populations. Uh, when you say African, is it African-American or is it a mixture of African and African-American? Uh, it's a mixture. So, yeah, on the right here you'll see this. Um, yeah, we, we've been using African slash African-American as our um, – uh, as our moniker in the papers, I believe on the website it might just say African, but it is it is certainly a mixture, and it is actually uh, the vast majority are African American. Um, there okay. are some exomes. In, in the coming population, will there be North African populations or Middle Eastern? Um, I'm actually so we're still kind of putting together the next release, and I don't believe we've actually assigned um, populations fully yet. I do believe there will be more. Um, African representation from the continent of Africa. I don't know about North Africa um, or the Middle East, and I'm, not, I'm actually not sure about the Middle East. Um, I can check on that and, and get back to you soon uh, with that information. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, there are some African, continental African individuals from um, in, in the data set, but they're uh, largely from the Thousand Genomes Project. Um, so they're mostly the same samples that you would get, if, you know, the same variants that you would get if you looked at Thousand Genomes. Um, but yeah, but otherwise, the vast majority are definitely African American. Um, okay, so yeah. thank you. Yep. Uh, so yeah, so we've created these subsets. So some of them are. So we've definitely have some that we've excluded cases from neuropsychiatric um, or neurological phenotypes. Um, another one where we've excluded cases of uh, cancer cases, and then another one um, where we've excluded any individual who is in Top Med Bravo, so that you can actually look at a um, kind of federated version of the data set where. If you look at Nomad and look at Bra Top Med Bravo, you can guarantee that that variant is or is not in the same individual um, if you turn on this uh, uh, this subset, um, so that you can actually be sure that you know maybe this variant is not in Bravo because the, the individual is not, or vice versa. Um, so just to move on, this data set contains about 230 million variants in the genomes, 15 million variants in the exomes. And on the right, you can see um, the number of variants in the exome is broken down by functional class as a function of sample size. Um, so this follows approximately a square root law, uh, quadruple your sample size, and you get about double the variance. Um, and so if we can then zoom in on the predicted loss of function variance, uh, we observe about a half a million of these. Um, and I should clarify that when I'm talking about predicted loss of function variance today, PLOS, I'm referring to stop gained essential splice and frame shift indel variance. Um, these are not going to be large gene deletions. That's going to be Ryan's purview li uh, uh, later in the hour. Um, so um, by having sequenced all these individuals, now we can actually get to kind of a deep density of, of about a half a million of these variants where we can actually kind of learn some cool things about, uh, about genes from, um, from the presence of these variants. Um, so now that we've increased our sensitivity and discovered a bunch of these rare putative loss of function variants, we'd now like to increase our specificity to really get a high quality set. Um, and I won't go through the details, but effectively, um, the, um, the kind of, as, as many of you I'm sure know, um, there's a phenomenon in which the kind of more interesting something looks, the more likely it is to be false. Um, and so loss of function variants are, are no stranger to these. They, um, you know, particularly ones that delete or that um, should ablate the expression of a kind of cr crucial gene, um, it is more likely to be an artifact. Um, and so we've... Uh, to this end, we've developed a tool that we call Lofty, which is a plugin to BEP that filters out some common error modes based on first principles, and um, and more importantly, and importantly, does not use frequency as one of its filters. So Lofty um, is kind of uh, um, uh, agnostic to frequency. Instead, looks at things like where in the gene does the loss of function variant fall, um, what are kind of the properties of the uh, of the splice site, for instance. Um, but in spite of the not using frequency, when we look at um, a metric that we use called the Mutability Adjusted Proportion of Singletons, or MAPS, which is a metric of deleteriousness based on frequency. Um, so higher MAPS means more rare and thus more deleterious. Um, the variants that are filtered out uh, uh, by Lofty have a frequency spectrum consistent with missense variants. So they are, they are um, lower MAPS, meaning they are less deleterious, whereas the ones that are retained by Lofty, so these are high confidence predicted loss of function variants, 
um, are, are they tend to be more rare, um, and thus we believe more deleterious. Um, so um, after filtering, we discovered about uh, 440,000 high confidence predicted loss of function variance. Um, and uh, when we finally filtered it all the way down, uh, if you look at not just the um, heterozygous ones, but the homozygous ones, we also have about 1,600 confident uh, homozygous variants um, that are actually knocking out um, each particular gene. Um, and we'll be sharing a list of those uh, shortly. Uh, so the kind of interesting thing, and I'm sure what many of you are interested in, is that uh, with this kind of high quality catalog of predicted loss of function variants, we can look not only at the genes which do have loss of function variants in the general population, but also genes where we don't see any loss of function variants. Um, and so a few years ago, Caitlin Samoha built some models to do just this, uh, which effectively says um, what it does is it takes uh, using first principle uh, mutational models, so that the mutation rate of um, of every transition that we or that we know about um, for, for single nucleotide variants. Um, this model then predicts the number of variants in a given functional class that we would expect to see in each gene in a cohort. Um, so she had applied this to the 60,000 individuals from EXAC. Um, I've then updated it to use, to, um, to, to, to use NOMAD. But effectively what it, you can then see is that um, using this model, basically this model creates an expected number of variants for each gene or for each set of basis, effectively for each transcript or, or exon or something like that. Um, and so when you correlate this with the observed number of variants, you see a very high correlation, especially for synonymous variants. You really do see a um, high correlation where, you know, the observed to expected uh, the R, it's not on the slide, but it's something like 0.97. Um, so we really do have a well-calibrated model to truly um, estimate the expected number of variants in exact or not. Um, and so when there that applies to protein truncated variants or predicted loss of function variants, um, we, you actually see a depletion of, uh, of expected of observed variants compared to the expectation. And just to be clear here, the expectation is a under no selection. We would have expected this many variants in, the, in, in each gene. Um, so it's actually, you know, uh, quite expected that we'd have a decrease of, uh, of, of observed variants compared to the expectation um, for predicted loss of function variants as these are actually deleterious and being selected out from the population. Um, so in, the, in, in those days, um, we, uh, we used a metric called PLI, the predicted loss of function, probability of loss of function intolerance, um, which then if you look at that, uh, um, it's really, it appears to be a continuous metric, but it really is kind of a binary thing where if you're above some probability, then you are you should be classified as uh, predicted uh, high uh, probability of loss of function intolerance or what we call constraint. Um, and so uh, this metric, I can go through quickly how kind of how we calculate it. I won't go into the very details, but I can show a kind of cartoon that hopefully helps um, kind of give some context on this. Uh, if you then take that observed to expected, um, plot that I t showed in the, in, in the previous slide and just create the ratio of observed to expected. Um, you do see that many genes are extremely depleted, have something like less than 20% or so observed compared to expected. Uh, this includes most of the known curated haplo-insufficient genes, which is good. That's kind of what we would expect to see. Um, uh, but then uh, it also includes a bunch of other genes that we have very little you know, uh, information about their function. Um, but one thing that we can see then when we, uh, uh, in order to, or one thing that we've then done, especially in the days of exact, but we've, we've recomputed it for, um, for, for Nomad, is um, transform this kind of uh, distribution that you see here into a mixture of three kind of Gaussian or well, actually Poisson um, parameters, um, which are known as PLI, PREC, and P null. Um, and so basically what this says is, Take those known curated haploinsufficient genes and tell me how, uh, what the kind of average observed to expected is, which is about 9% or so, um, this, uh, you know, on the left side of this, uh, this plot. Um, and attempt to fit, based on that, um, three Poisson distributions um, that then uh, assign each gene into PLI, PREC, or PNOL. PLI meaning, you know, basically ask the question, does this gene look like an ultra-constrained gene? Is it you know close to something like 10% observed to expected? PREC is more the recessive genes where you don't necessarily have um, a strong depletion of the loss of function variance, although there still is some. And P null is the kind of null distribution, so there is effectively as many observed as expected, 
um, which is not, you know, the kind of uninteresting. Uh, does anyone have, have any questions about that? Because I know that's one of the things that we're we're most asked about uh, in terms of uh, in terms of how this is computed. Okay, I guess not. Um, yeah, so um, in this kind of mode, what you can see is that, um, it, so it's, it's kind of a subtle point, but the, um, the, the really important thing about PLI is that it is truly not a continuous value, um, even though it kind of looks like one. Um, the, the recommendation for PLI is to just consider a, uh, a cutoff of some kind, like 0.9 or 0.95, something, something along those lines. Um, and, and just say, if you're above this line, you are a constrained gene. You are in the kind of ultra-constrained mode, um, rather than using it as a ranking of any sort. Um, and the reason for that is just because of this mixture of Poissons that we, that we fit, um, it's not really meant to be a, a continuous value. Um, so instead, what we've done in, in this iteration, um, you know, if, if, if all you're asking is the question, is it a constrained gene or not? Um, the PLI value is a perfectly fine way to do that. Um, but we've kind of uh, accepted that biology is more complicated than yes or no. Um, you know, it's not a binary thing. Um, there are uh, gradations of, of constraints. Um, and so what we've done more recently is um, uh, we could transform this observed to expected into um, a metric that we're calling LUF, which is basically if we take the observed to expected, we can actually draw a confidence interval around that value, and the upper bound of that confidence, the confidence interval is, um, is, is our new metric for constraint. Um, so just to give an example, um, if we have this gene called MED13L, uh, which is already well associated with severe intellectual disability, um, if you look at the synonymous variance, you have approximately the same number observed as expected, um, which means that the model is quite well calibrated for this gene. Observed to expected is around one, and the confidence interval is definitely over that one. Um, but if you look at predicted loss of function variance, we would expect it 102 of these in the cohort, um, but we observe actually zero. Um, and so, and so obviously the observed to expected is zero, but also based on the sample, the size of this gene, um, we can actually be very confident that there, that the true observed to expected is much, much less than one. Um, and so um, you can then do this for other genes where you may not have a known phenotype, for instance, FNDC3B, um, where you see kind of the same pattern. You see the um, approximately the correct number observed to expected for synonymous variants, but again, a strong depletion of predicted loss of function variants. Um, so this gene has no known human phenotype, but it results in death at birth when knocked out in mouth. Um, so obviously, if you see a rare disease patient with an LOF in this gene, you might be pretty concerned. Um, so this, uh, this upper bound of this confidence interval um, for this gene is for MED13L is 0 0.03, for fndc 3 b is 0 0.04, is a much more um, kind of true, truly continuous value, um, which we then term LUF, uh, the loss of function observed to expected upper bound fraction. Um, the name might be a little bit silly, but the, um, it, it kind of is the, the best thing that we can come up with that actually kind of keeps the meaning of, of, of the metric. Um, and this, so using this upper bound, we kind of correct for some of the small genes. So um, if these two genes are very large, we would have expected something like 102 and 68 uh, variants, um, or loss of function variants in these two genes. Uh, but it, in a gene where observed is zero, but maybe expected is two, you're not quite as confident that that is actually a strong depletion. Um, so LUF actually corrects for that and knows that observed zero, expected two would actually have a, quite a high LUF score. I think it would be something like 1.7. I don't remember exactly, but it's, it's quite high. Um, so kind of, um, yeah. Uh, as our sample sizes grow, uh, these kind of LUF will converge on the observed to expected ratio, um, so which is, uh, you know, quite natural uh, to, you know, as, as our sample sizes get larger. Uh, but for now, we kind of use this correction for, especially for small genes, to, to really, um, uh, to really get across both the effect size and our confidence. Um, just to give you an, uh, an idea behind, the, the kind of intuition behind that, if you uh, plot LUF versus the observed to expected ratio, um, especially for large genes, you certainly have a high or, 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 or very well correlated. Um, but for some small genes in particular, um, you can actually have an increased LUF uh, uh, score even if the observed expected is zero. So another way to get uh, across is if you, if I color this by um, the expected number of variants um, for each gene, 
Um, you can see that these ones in light blue, which have a high number of expected variants based on their uh, mutational properties and their size, um, you know, they're generally correlated with, uh, the observed expected is generally correlated with LUF, um, but for ones that are, have a lower expected number of uh, variants, so these are smaller genes, um, LUF is actually increased at these, uh, at these genes. Um, I'm not going to go through that. I'm kind of running a little bit low on time. Uh, but for those who are curious about what it looks like with um, compared to PLI, um, this is kind of what I uh, uh, kind of uh, refer to when I mean that it's it's not really to be used as a continuous value, whereas LUF can be. Um, if you can look at uh, LUF versus PLI, you, you see that in, indeed all the genes that are kind of uh, high PLI are also you know low on the LUF scale. So just to be clear, we've kind of flipped the scale now. Um, lower LUF value means more constraint. Um, but uh, for those where you have fewer number of variants expected, um, you do see kind of a tail off of LUF, whereas in PLI, you know, you might have a PLI of 0.5 or 0.25 or so, um, even for a very small gene, whereas LUF will actually correct that a little bit better. Um, are there any questions about that? That's kind of the meat of the, um, the, the methodology, so if anyone has any questions now is a good time. Hi, Dr. Kaczewski, it's Jenny. So there were a couple of questions that came up in the chat box. Um, so one is um, for the loss of function variants that were artifacts, were they of any particular type, uh, for example, indels? Um, they do, t uh, indels do tend to be more artifactual than SNPs just because um, not only do we have a, you know, we have a low prior on them and the variant calling is not quite as good for indels as it is for SNPs. So, there's definitely a higher false positive rate for indels still, even after, even before our filters and even after our filters, there's still going to be a higher false positive rate for indels. Um, although we believe it's getting much, much better as our variant calling algorithms are improving. Um, so we're, it's, it's not so, it's not a, it's no longer the same kind of um, stark contrast as it was even three to five years ago. Um, these, these call sets, you definitely do have uh, quite high quality indels. Uh, but, that said, there is still some uh, more artifacts there. Okay, great. And then another question, um, how is genomic architecture and gene size affecting the loss of function observed over expected and the confidence interval? Yeah, so the, um, yeah, the, the basics behind this, this calculation, this observed to expected calculation actually is probably best shown right here. Um, is that the expected is very highly correlated with the gene size. I mean, it's basically, um, what we've actually done is just gone, gone through the gene and summed the possible SNPs in that gene, weighted them by the mutation rate of that particular transition, um, and used that to effectively compute the expected uh, um, counts. So expected is very highly correlated with gene size, um, which is why, you know, you see this kind of nice correlation for synonymous variants. Um, and that, that depletion then, so, what that means is that depletion, when you have a lower observed to expected ratio, um, you have a higher confidence in those which are larger genes because, you know, as, as I mentioned here, you know, if you have observed zero expected 102, you're much more confident that there's a very constrained gene compared to if your observed was zero, but your expected was two. Um, and so, uh, the LUF kind of builds that in and then has, um, uh, yeah, ha has that value. Um, so. It is still, loss is definitely still correlated with gene size, and there's really not much we can do about that at the moment. As our sample sizes grow, observed to expected itself um, is the much more natural thing to use. Um, but I don't know if I have it here. Uh, oops. Um, but I believe, yeah, I don't have it in the slide deck, but I just put together a new um, figure that kind of shows when we'll get to use observed to expected more naturally, and it really appears to be in the kind of 10 million sample size, um, which is certainly sounds like a lot and it's it is a lot but it's you know we, we were growing at a factor of about two per year so getting to 10 million is um, you know certainly on the horizon um, probably you know, um, you know quite, quite a few years out still but but not uh, not impossible that would be amazing. Um, so I have another question from uh, Matt Wright, who's with the ClinGen Stanford uh, interface team. So um, he's asking, currently the Nomad data is only available via download. So do you plan to provide uh, on-the-fly access in any way, such as via API? Yeah, um, we do have a, um, a beta API. I don't believe it's public yet. Um, we're, we're working on it. Um, we're, we're currently trying to figure out how best to do 
to serve that up and um, you know and have it kind of scale and uh, you know allow everyone to use it reliably. Um, so I don't believe it's it's public quite yet, but it is in the works. Um, in the meantime, if, for those who are more computationally inclined and want to use um, um, and, and want to use more kind of advanced tools, um, the Hail tool that I described earlier actually does have a mechanism for looking at kind of single variants at a time or groups of variants. Um, you can do filters on the data that only return and then download those particular data, um, those particular uh, variants. Um, that said, it's still, it is still a, quite a challenging um, uh, it, interface to use. It's a Python interface that is, uh, you know, a, a kind of a custom um, Python interface. So um, it really does require some advanced uh, programming. Um, but if, if that's in your wheelhouse, then, um, then, I, then that is a way to, use, to kind of look at single variants at a time before, um, you know, before our API is ready. Um, I don't have an ETA on the API, unfortunately. Um, the, I, I believe they're still kind of working on the scaling and making sure that it can reliably work. Great, thank you. Um, great. So, in just the last few minutes, um, I'll just kind of get go through quickly what um, what uh, what we see when we actually look at these LUST scores. Uh, we can bend, bend the spectrum into deciles, um, where on the left is the more depleted or more constrained genes, and the right is the more tolerant or more, less constrained genes. Um, and as I mentioned before, known haploid sufficient genes are very much skewed towards the left. Left deciles, left deciles have lower left scores. Uh, receptive genes are somewhere in the middle. And then on the right, we have kind of some genes like olfactory receptors, which are not constrained. Um, so this is kind of our, you know, our, our uh, true negatives um, that are, we don't expect to be constrained, um, and, and indeed most of the time aren't. Um, they reflect the, uh, the data that we see in mouse and cellular knockout phenotypes. So um, lower left uh, scores tend to be more um, correlated with a um, percentage of, of genes that are heterozygous lethal when knocked out in mouse. Um, as well as in CRISPR screens, you see those that are cellular essential um, are uh, have lower love scores, whereas the non-essential ones have higher. Um, I'm going to skip this because I think Ryan's going to talk about it. Um, but effectively, they're correlated with um, with structural variants, um, so I'll let him, him describe that. Um, and then also correlated with biological biological relevance. So um, more constrained genes tend to have more protein-protein interactions and tend to be more central to a protein-protein interaction network, um, as well as highly expressed across multiple tissues, so they tend to be more um, expressed in more tissues than unconstrained genes. Um, disease genes have lower love scores as well, so the ones um, that are on the left side are more likely to be found in OMIM. Um, and one kind of interesting thing, thing is that if you actually break it out, um, OMIM, by which technology was uh, uh, discovered that disease gene, whether there was exome or genome sequencing um, versus conventional old, like, linkage um, uh, mapping, you know, from I, mean, I say old, you know, about more than five years ago, effectively. Um, you do see that those that have uh, that were discovered by exome sequencing do tend to be more constrained, um, and these are kind of the, those that are often found in the de novo state. Um, so these were, you know, study designs where um, where they're looking for de novo variants um, um, for for a rare disease patient. Connor, I have a question about this. Yep. Um, considering the fact that genes can be associated with multiple disease entities, and those could be defined based on molecular mechanism, loss of function versus gain of function, yep. are you seeing any deviations in genes where they do have multiple molecular mechanisms that are causing disease? Um, it's a good question. I have not looked into that, actually. I haven't found, um, I mean, maybe I didn't look hard enough, but I didn't see any sort of uh, indicator like that in OMIM to see whether you could, you could split it out kind of computationally. Um, I would love to, if, if, there, if that does exist there, it's possible I just didn't look very hard for it, so um, I may have just missed it. Um, but that definitely is an interesting thing to, I, I can take a look at. Yeah, and it's one thing too, just to remind, like for our curators in general, that while loss of function, a gene can be loss of function constrained, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the mechanism of the gene disease relationship yeah. you're looking at. So being careful to score for loss of function and really knowing that's the mechanism. For sure, uh, of course, that is, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and which also, by the way, means that an unconstrained gene, you know, on the flip side of that, an unconstrained gene may is not necessarily something to rule it out on, especially if you're thinking a gain of function kind of mechanism. You know, a, a gene could be unconstrained for loss of function variants, but a gain of function uh, variant could be very, very bad. Um, but we're not looking for that. Also, we'll miss recessives sometimes. Sorry. Yeah. And recessives will often not be that yeah. the LOS. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the also a cr crucial point, um, as I showed uh, here. Um, yep. Recessives do tend to be in the middle of this. Um, yeah, so this is definitely a score for dominant um, disease genes, 
um, in particular, which is why PLI was such an effective metric that if you're high PLI, you're more likely to be in this kind of um, uh, known haploinsufficient gene uh, uh, range. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, so um, the finally, I'm just going to skip right ahead, actually. Um, okay, I still have a few minutes. Good. Um, basically, uh, if we look at um, the, these love scores based on um, in patients with developmental delay or intellectual disability, um, these uh, patients are actually 15 times more likely to have a de novo LOS in the most constrained decile of the genome, this, um, you know, this, this first decile. Um, and uh, this is just looking at uh, patients with de novos um, uh, for, for intellectual disability and developmental delay. Um, integrating expression data improves this even further, and we have a companion manuscript uh, written by Barul Cummings um, on, on this, so I invite you to look, at, uh, look into that if you want. Um, these, these scores are also co correlated with common diseases, um, so uh, especially um, traits that have previously shown an enrichment of ultra-rare variants um, are also enriched among constrained genes. In particular, a lot of these um, um, cognitive uh, traits are, um, and like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and educational attainment um, uh, are, are correlated with constraint metrics. Um, so as you all know, I'm sure if, if you've been to the website at nomad.rotinstitute.org, uh, we've we publicly release this data with no publication restrictions. Um, you're free to use the data, download the data, use it however you want. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, and we've also released a browser uh, to, um, that you can kind of, uh, thanks to the tireless efforts of, uh, of Matt and Nick, um, really put together a nice, uh, shiny new browser that is actually quite responsive and uh, much faster than the browser that I built for Exec many years ago. Um, but effectively, uh, here you can see kind of some new features on the browser in, in particular. Um, the subsets that I mentioned previously um, are in the top right, so you can actually go and um, filter to just the, those controls only or, uh, you know, the non-neuro, um, non-psych uh, subsets or the SVs that Ryan will talk about in a moment. Um, the constraint metrics that I've just described are here in this box. We've uh, recomputed PLI for um, Core Nomad, but we also um, provide all these the, the other scores I just mentioned and, and luck at the moment isn't particularly well um, highlighted but I think we're thinking about how it's to fixed. Yeah. No, it's fixed Conrad it's just you didn't update the slide. Oh sorry. Yep, I wasn't sure I have yeah. Okay. Never mind. Um there are luck is a little bit more well highlighted now. Uh but in any case it's this um uh, the upper bound of the confidence interval here. Um we can also show the gene model with transcripts, um, including you know kind of break down which transcript is the uh, you know is the most um, maybe and also including their expression um, across tissues. We show the mean expression, but you can also if you have a tissue of interest um, select that one. Um, a new score called text, which is the proportion of ex uh, expression in transcripts um, at that, um, uh, a, that about that um, uh, uh, expression kind of filter that I that I mentioned previously. Um, and, um, and as well, we're, we're now also providing pathogenic ClinVar variants alongside, so you can kind of provide context for the variants that you see, whether there is, um, you know, wh whether these are found in ClinVar or tend to be near variants that are found in ClinVar. Um, finally, there's also structural variants, and again, um, I believe uh, Ryan will talk about these a little more, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but these are now available in the browser as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Um, the, all the papers that we've uh, um, put together are now available in BioArchive. We've put together um, the, the manuscript that I just talked about, as well as six companion manuscripts alongside it um, that have different applications. So if you're interested in any of these, um, I invite you to check these out. Um, and with that, I'll thank uh, all the folks involved in this, in particular my co-conspirators, Laurent and Grace, um, as well as all of the leadership of, of Daniel and Mark, um, uh, the Hale team for all their help, and, uh, and the Broad Institute, especially the Genomics Data Science platform. Happy to take any other questions. I still want to fly by, but I'm not sure how to read that again. So, um. Um, so I had a chance to check on the Middle Eastern with and, and North African, African with Jessica. And for V3, there, we're not expecting to see much improvement. But for the next exome call set, which will be hopefully sometime in 2020, um, we wish we will have a Middle Eastern component then. So that will be exciting. And then, Conrad, one of the things that I get questioned about a lot is the sometimes the like the constraint score, either the PLRI or the or the loss, is pretty different between Exac and Nomad. And so, you've, I know you've incorporated some additional features in the new constraint calculations, and so it can it can change actually the number of expectation at fair amount between Exac and Nomad. Can you explain that a little more? 
Yeah, I mean, there's unfortunately, like, unfortunately, it's not one thing I can say because there's a lot of little reasons why it may have changed, and each gene might be different. So, um, I had a look at that one that um that was mentioned previously, Shank two, um, was was is very wildly different between Atec and Nomad, and actually the reason for that, I actually trust Nomad a little bit more in that case, um, in in a in a sense. Um, so what previously in Exac, uh, all the coverage correction was done at the exon level. And in Shank2, um, Shank2 is actually, I mean, it's not a particularly well-covered gene. Um, and so, I'll, yeah, I guess I should say that I trust Nomad's value more, but that said, I actually trust, I might trust it less because generally speaking, it is like when it's not particularly well-covered, um, we have a tough time kind of getting a good uh, estimate of its constraint. Um, and in Exac, basically what had happened is um, previously, uh, those exons that were low-covered were filtered out entirely. Whereas now I've done a little bit more of an adaptive algorithm that um, that considers even low coverage, not just low coverage exon, but low coverage bases. So it's a little bit more fine grained. Now there's an irony. Actually, let me pull up Shen too. Um, hopefully, folks can um, see my screen um, in a moment. Um, there we go. Um, can folks see that? Yeah, I can. Cool. Um, yeah, so um, one kind of uh, um, irony of Shank 2 is that uh, the, yeah, while the PLI is now zero, um, it actually, this PLI is computed for the canonical transcript. Um, and if you show the transcript, the canonical transcript is actually, does not look, appear to be a particularly good transcript. There's a lot of kind of garbage exons in the middle that, and if you look at the loss of function variance in this gene, you see that they're all in these kind of middle, uh, they're kind of, I guess one third of the way into the gene um, exons, which do not appear to be expressed particularly across tissues. Whereas the second egg transcript, which is the highly expressed transcript, all of its exons are down here um, over on the left side, um, where you actually do not see very many loss of function variants in these exons. So if we went and recomputed, which we have done, but we haven't kind of, we're still kind of tinkering with it a little bit, we haven't really, really seen. Um, Conrad, if, if you click on the second transcript, it will update the constraint table. Oh, excellent. There you go. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. I actually did not know that. Was okay. That's great. Um, so, yeah, if you then go and do that, you can actually see that, indeed, this gene is now quite constrained, the PLI score of 1 again, because observed as 1, expected as uh, 38. Um, so, this, this is a funny example, because it's both, in, in some senses, it's both better and worse in Nomad than it was in Exec. Um, Exec was the correct value overall. Um, but in this particular case, it's actually because of both coverage, the calculation, the coverage calculation that we did previously, and also this issue where this particular transcript, um, the second one, is the most expressed one. And when you look at only those exons, you do see a, um, a strong depletion of loss of function variance. Um, we do have a, yeah, like, as I started alluding to, we do have a, a mechanism to filter out these unexpressed exons um, and kind of and recompute constraints for those. Um, we haven't yet thought about the best way to release that, whether it's it, whether it's actually the best um, form of it. It certainly, it doesn't seem to make a huge difference on the global scale, but individual genes like this will certainly be affected. But there's hey, definitely um, cases where, sorry. Sorry to yeah. interrupt you. Yeah, so uh, I was wondering, like, what percent of your data set has a long read sequencing, or, you know, these all entire data all set is short? 100% oh. short read, yeah. Okay, so um, this, what this, do you think, like, you know, uh, how the CLI will change, uh, 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 probability of loss of function uh, intolerance will change if you if you look at the, you know, long read sequencing data? I, I honestly think that our short read sequencing calling is quite good. Um, so I don't, I don't actually think that globally things will change if you do, a, you know, a long, long read sequencing. There's probably some very strong exceptions to that rule in genes that are hard to map for short read sequencing. Um, so... At an individual gene level, there may be some differences, but at a global scale, our, 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 our scores are quite good. Um, and you can actually, as I kind of previously mentioned, you can kind of uh, um, kind of see that based on some of the coverage of some of these exons. So if you have a very low coverage exon, we are not confident in our, um, in our constrained assessment of that. So for that, perhaps long range sequencing would help. But actually, one thing I'll note is that um, as we move to more, more and more, not long read sequencing, but genome instead, so this green um, coverage track you can see, which is um, the average coverage in the genome. So actually, in fact, even in the exon exomic region, um, a whole genome sequencing, especially the PCR-free genome sequencing, 
um, already improves us quite, quite a bit. Um, so I think we'll get a lot of gains from that before we move to long reach, even before we move to long reach. 